going on, everybody? Welcome into the highlight. I am your host, Chandler Lyles, and today, as always, well, sometimes, not all the time, but most of the time, I'm joined by my uh, friend slash business partner, Austin Lynch. Austin, how are you doing today, man? I'm glad you showed up for work today. <laughs> I'm feeling good, Chandler. I've got my official work shirt on. I've got my official coffee mug for work. We're ready to go. As it's, an advertising uh, agency. Here, but it's... It's all good. Yeah, as an advertising agency, you're definitely doing a better job than I am representing the company and what we believe <laughs> is like consistency in branding. So uh, I guess you win today. Uh, but I am excited. Today we're, we're sharing the highlight with a new friend, uh, Don Craig, the founder of Finley's. Uh, Don, is it just Finley's? It's like share, right? Like we don't need Finley's market. No, we don't need other other words. It's just Finley's, the, uh, the clothing uh, empire being built here in Nashville, Tennessee area. Don, how are you doing? I am good. Thanks for having me. It's uh, yeah. rainy here where I am, and I think where you are too. So it's yeah. a little bit dreary. Not great for our brick and mortar shoppers, but that's why we have online stores. So we're yeah, we're, we're rolling with it. Well, I can't wait to talk about that. I, I do want to get into the differences in advertising and marketing your business when you have a brick and mortar store and an ecom um, presence, because I know you guys have both, and I know your your Finley stores are very foot traffic dependent area. So I'm very excited to like dig into the nuances of that because yeah, when it's pouring like it is outside, I got the window closed behind me, but maybe I should open it. It's literally like a monsoon outside. It's like, you can't even see 20 feet in front of you. It's, it's crazy. So, but before we get to that, I'd love to know like how in the world did you start Finley's? Like that is a, you guys are killing it. And I just want to know when did it start? How did it start? All the, all the stories. Sure. Um, there's always, Lots of stories to tell, but really Finley's, uh, so the main store of Finley's is in Franklin. Um, mm -hmm. It's a smaller town just south of Nashville. It's very um, classic downtown. It's got a great theater they've revitalized there. So it is just a real nice place to spend a Saturday afternoon. Um, and I got there just by happenstance, I think, um, when we moved to Nashville, which was in 2008, I uh, was originally working from home for a company. Um, and I say that now because it feels like so many years later. <laughs> yeah, it was revolutionary when you were doing it. Right, right. But like most people, I was in sales and um, I was selling cheese of all things. Um, I think it's a okay. great thing to sell. I love cheese. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it sells itself. Gonna, that's right. If you're going to sell anything, cheese is a great thing. 99% uh, of people eat it. They consume it. They want more. Um, and so I, I like to go for the easy way of doing things. Um, yeah. But then I started Finley's and, and, and that was a whole different <laughs> ball of wax. But um, <laughs> Yeah, so I was in retail. So I sold cheese to mm -hmm. grocery national retailers, so grocery chains, major grocery chains. Um, and I really enjoyed that. Um, but the one part I didn't enjoy was when we were meeting with our customers. So I sold, um, you know, my customers were the retailers, and then their customers are the consumers like you and me that go mm -hmm. into the stores. Um, and I felt like we talked a lot, but we didn't talk hardly anything about the customers. Mm -hmm. So I felt like I enjoyed retail, um, but I thought that I could do it better. So <laughs> as you know, life progressed and things transitioned for me and my family, I was set on owning my own business. It had, I wanted it to be in retail. And it happened to be in fashion. So I actually um, bought the business. It was a, like in downtown Franklin. We're here locally and I liked the location. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of really it. Um, bought the business in September of 2014. I had gone to market, my first ever market, um, just a month before with the previous owner. 
Um, and for so, those that don't know, market is where you go because you guys are like sort of a um, it's a boutique, right? But it's yeah. it's a you you go out and you you have buyers. Uh, I always think about Rachel from Friends. That's what I am yeah. picturing. She she's buying for big box stores, but you're you're buying for your local boutique, right? Like that's what the market is. That's right. So there's several markets throughout the year, and the vendors come to one place, the buyers come to one place. You get to see the fashion. Um, it is it is fun. It is fun. And what I realized very quickly is that, um, and I say this a lot, and I don't mean to discourage people, but I don't necessarily have a passion for fashion. You can see I'm just kind of plain. Uh, but I do have a passion for people. Mm. <laughs> so that that's really, I guess, even from beginning when we when I started and I wanted to be in retail it was about the people um, to today that's still the very motivating factor um, I do enjoy fashion I do enjoy uh, retail therapy um, but yeah so bought the business went to market um, in October you know fourth quarter we're in it now but fourth quarter is a big time for retail. Did you buy it? You bought it going into Q4? Yeah. So September wow. 2014. Wow. It's uh, like buying and, something that you have very little experience in. And it's like, Hey, uh, we're playing the Super Bowl next week. And I know you've never actually played this sport, but like, if you don't <laughs> crush this game coming up, uh, you might not be around in January. This, this thing you just bought is going to be worth a lot less in about five <laughs> minutes. <laughs> I didn't, you, you should have been my coach back then. Cause I didn't really think like that, but I did learn that lesson because in October we ran out of product and I was oh like, my. Oh no. <laughs> back to so Don, I'm curious, you know, as, as we're talking about Q4, obviously right now we're in the middle of it. We just got through the, you know, big sales holidays and black Friday and cyber Monday. I would love to hear a little bit about kind of the differences. Obviously you bought the business in September going into a Q4 Tell me about how Finley's has kind of evolved in the way that you approach Q4 from back when you bought it in 2014 to now in 2022. Tell me about what's different and maybe what's the same. Sure. Um, that's a good question. So a lot of things are different. Um, I think Chandler kind of pointed it out. It's, you know, there's, there's a lot of planning that most people do. Um, I yep. had not done that, that first season. Although I, you know, I come, I am a da da data nerd, I had gone through the numbers mm -hmm. and I had kind of said, okay, this is how much I want to buy. I mean, it's a fortunate thing that you sell out more than what you buy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so now now you know i think oh goodness we're in december now so probably by august we had an idea of the different promotions or different product that we wanted to bring in um what that looked like as far as timing what it looked like as far as um you know what the customer was what we would expect the customer to really be um excited about and all the different days there's so many days even oh yeah i i continue to learn about different days so one of the things we were talking about yesterday was that next monday is green monday mm -hmm. are you familiar with this i am yes so we that you know we do a lot of e-commerce marketing uh yeah. a lot of e-commerce digital marketing and so that's sort of where um i've spent a lot of time learning probably you know over the last five or six years and it is amazing you mentioned days i've she's talking about sales holidays obviously the ones that everyone think about you know you've got black friday and cyber monday uh but yeah you know green monday is a big one a lot of people put an emphasis on you know, they'll, they'll create their own day out of, you know, last day for shipping. If you want to guarantee it gets there before Christmas, there are, I've seen people shift after that, you know, to in, kind of keep an ongoing message running. Mm -hmm. I've seen people switch from last day to shipping to, Oh, you missed out. So now it's time to, you know, get your digital gift card as your last minute stocking stuffer. You know, we, we've seen it all. And yeah. green Monday is definitely one that I've always kind of, had a little bit of a help, uh, head tilt towards. It's a little bit, 
suspicious to me. It feels like we're just needing to stretch it out and cram one more day in there. But well, Don, Don I do know about this. that one. As marketers, we we are going to try to make every day a big sales day, and so it's like, hey, this is a random Monday in December. We should we should brand it a certain way to make people feel like they need to go do something. Right? That's right. Yeah, Don, we're we're gluttons for punishment, so we have like we're like a <laughs> basically a decentralized advertising agency. So instead of you bringing somebody in house, we end up doing it um, for you on the side as like a partner. And so it's funny because we end up having like you know, 10 different clients that are all in different spaces that are doing this stuff. And yeah, so we get to hear about all the random holidays that come up and it's, it's a, it is overwhelming sometimes just to try to keep up with like, you know, if you have a restaurant brand, for instance, and all of a sudden it's, it's official national taco day. Like we have to create a whole unique campaign around tacos every Tuesday. And it's, it's just like, there's 52 Tuesdays in a year. That's too many Tuesdays. Like it's, it's, that's, I'm not that smart. I don't have that many ideas done. I can't do it. <laughs> I think that the, um, I don't know what they call it, like the cognitive, creative uh, ideas, that is definitely a skill today mm -hmm. for uh, people. And, and it feels like a marathon sometimes mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. you do look at the, the month or the year or the quarter, just kind of oh, how yeah. we break things up, um, that it feels like, whew. Um, I'm in a creative industry. That's why I work with a lot of people that are creative. So yeah, it, it is, um, it is real. Um, but you know, even now, like we're, so we're already thinking about the week before, um, the Christmas holiday and mm -hmm. we're, you know, that's kind of done for us. So we're doing our photo yeah. shoot for January, for athleisure, you know, <laughs> closet oh. clean out, spring, you know, um, we're just, it, it is, oh goodness, um, it is a lot. I'm just talking about it. I'm thinking about all the, all the <laughs> <laughs> well, this is supposed to be a fun conversation. We don't mean yeah. to make you go back to thinking about work, but it is, it is weird. You almost end up living in like this time dilation because you're thinking like six months in mm -hmm. advance and you're already living there. You're like, Hey, what are people going to be thinking around July 4th? And it's like, everybody's still freezing cold and getting snowed on in the middle of January. And, and as marketers and especially in your industry inside of, uh, fashion and and because i know clothing is a big part of what you guys do i know you have other products there as well but i would imagine clothing is a big driver of revenue for you guys so you yeah. got to be thinking about what people are going to be wearing in the summertime when it's the middle of cold it's a it's a tricky thing so but i, I want to go back really quick the the thing you talked about a minute ago where you don't have a passion for fashion there was a it rhymes so like that's going to stick out in my head i i like that <laughs> I, I need you to keep rhyming as we go through this interview <laughs> That's a must now, uh, very Dr. Seuss-esque. I think that's what the people want. But the, the question is, like, you hear it, like, I've, I, you hear the advice on both sides of the fence, right? Where it's like, follow your passion, go do the thing that you're most passionate about, that you love. And then you have other people that say, you know, you know, find, find problems in the marketplace and sort of learn how to love the thing. And, and it sort of becomes something that you love over time. And it, I mean, you've done this for almost 10 years now since you guys bought Finley's in 14. So it's 22 mm -hmm. now it's almost 23. So, um, you have to like it at some level now, like you have to have developed a certain level of passion, maybe not just for fashion, but there's other aspects within the business. So the people side of things, that's interesting. I'd love for you to like unpack what about people makes you feel so alive. Uh, well, people are interesting. That's what I think. Um, and, um, one of the things I don't, work as much in the store. So, you know, when we bought the business, I was fortunate, even though I did run out of product, I knew where to get more. Um, but there were a few team members that came with the business. Um, so I didn't have to start from scratch. And actually it was called a different name at that time. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about marketing, it was called Good Findings. And people thought it was just, mm -hmm. it was a like, uh, like a resale store, which would be super cool, but that wasn't what we Interesting. were. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's so called confusing Finley's. branding. Yeah. <laughs> Back then. Yeah, yeah. Because we so I I I named it Finley's. Uh, Finley is my daughter, and mm -hmm. and really the, it again still today she's fifteen today, um, but wow. it is that idea of like this like I really wanted people to come in 
and leave feeling like more confident and specifically women. I, I mean, we had lots of men's products at one point as well too, but it was really trying to give that sense of uh, this confident sense. So I do feel like, you know, clothing, accessories help um, to really support people, uh, women specifically, and feeling, you know, good about themselves. And so it is nothing better in your day, I think, when you can sit with somebody and just be a moment in their life, you know, like be a moment in their life story. And I think about all those those times you don't think that happens in a store and I will say that maybe today it doesn't feel like we have time for those moments but they do still happen yeah. but you know like I was in a fitting room with the lady whose father had passed and she inherited his trucking business <laughs> All right. Oh wow! <laughs> and she had come in because it was a really hard day and she just she worked with a lot of guys and she just wanted to feel like pretty and feminine and you know we just had like a total meltdown in the fitting room just because it was a stressful day for her but mm. she left with like three or four cute tops and you know she just we were impactful. You know, I was there, yeah. she was there, the team was there. People that well, That's important. Yeah. I mean, there's so much going on that can stress us all out in a, you know, any given day, especially I couldn't imagine, I mean, running this business that that Chandler and I are are kind of in the middle of. That's a lot of work. It's a lot of worry, it's a lot of stress, uh and and having that put on you, I can only imagine how intense that would be. So yeah, I could definitely see how coming in and, you know, leaving feeling a little bit more confident or even just, you know, having a moment to get away from all of that. Um, to your point, it's a special thing and being able to give that to people. I could see how that is rewarding, even if, you know, your your number one passion, as you mentioned earlier, isn't necessarily fashion, just helping people get that moment, get that kind of relief or that extra feeling of, you know, a boosted confidence. That's, that's yeah. pretty incredible. What's cool to me too, is that the taking a moment to be human with that customer, is it like, that's a big yeah. win. And you know, a lot of times people, you know, we run into people all the time that are like, Hey, just run this ad. I'm trying to make more money. I'm trying to sell more stuff. Da da da. And then we go do an audit of their business and we look at their, their customer service stuff and they don't realize that customer service is probably you know, if you're lucky enough to have customers, customer service is line number one of advertising because what's going to happen is what we've seen is that a customer that has a positive experience will talk to five, ten people and that's sort of positive word of mouth and that's very powerful and they'll go out and they'll tell people to come to Finley's and, you know, I all those all the women in that woman's life are going to go shop at Finley's now. Guarantee you. Like you, you just – you've built such a moat around her with that memorable moment that there's no way – you're going to go shop anywhere else. Like, especially if you guys have the things that other people have, like, it's just, it's, it's, it's impenetrable from a customer acquisition standpoint. But the negative side of things is if you just treat people like, um, like numbers or like a, a widget to be run through your store and you're looking at the spreadsheet and we're, we're all data people. Like you said, you like data and that's, it's very important to love data. And I love that data is having a, a big moment now and it's getting more and more and more. And Austin's definitely the data side of our business for sure. But there is still a, a world where if you have a negative experience, here's what the data says, you're going to have that person can go tell 50 people and they don't just tell 10 about like, they only tell 10 when it's positive. They tell 50 when it's negative. And so, yeah, going in and making sure your customer service is on point is a, um, it, it's mandatory if you want to have a, a healthy business in 2023 and beyond. Do you guys at Finley's have like a specific sort of way you tell your team to treat employee or uh, to treat customers, whether it's online or in person? Yeah, I mean, we have training. And I think that one of the things we talk about with the team is that we don't really take ourselves too seriously. Uh, we like to have fun. I think that the... Our I could never work there, Austin. <laughs> <laughs> fun we have is an one ongoing... of our core values, Don, And uh, that's one that I've had to wrestle Chandler for over the last couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. And making customers matter is our number one core value. So um, and that. that's kind of translated not only for our 
customers, but for our team. So as we've grown, our our support team, you know, has internal customers as well. It's something that we continue to um, have to revisit, I feel like. Um, in my opinion, I still think we have a long way to go for that customer experience. I will say that if you're talking about what it looks like in 2023 and beyond, uh, it is difficult, I, or I feel like there is a challenge to um, translate what you can get with that in-person experience um, for our team and for the customers into that feeling when you're interacting online. Though, I mean, sure. um, we're, we learn more every day. I just talked to, I just had an email from a lady in Canada who had um, a you know issue with one of the products that she had bought. So we made it right. And she emailed and she's like, I got, it was earrings. Um, and she's like, I got the earrings today. Thank you so much for handling it. I'm going to, mm -hmm. Think of think of Finley's and just remember to be kind, you know, when I wear them because I yeah. I yeah. translate to feel her to say like I she felt taken care of so then she awesome. remember to take care of other people so hopefully um, and I think you know I see this with my kids I have older kids now and they're very comfortable interacting digitally and creating relationships digitally that mm -hmm. I'm total Gen X. It's just, you know, <laughs> it doesn't feel sure. as accessible to me, but that mindset of, of, of a different perspective, I think is important um, for me to think about as we're creating those uh, digital relationships. Yeah. Do you guys have like some things you're doing to make digital relationships feel as special as they do when they are in store? Like, is there anything specific that you can point to as an organization that you find that that works i i think as we've trialed and aired a lot of processes steps um in customer acquisition um i feel like what has been most successful is is taking the initial touch point where they're in the store and then transitioning it to the online yeah. um, relationship. So, you know, um, for example, we've tried getting like email signups via Facebook ads and those uh, email captures are less likely to actually convert or open rates as compared to the you know, we have a loyalty program. So that even though we sure. get a lot of tourists in all of our locations, you kind of mentioned in our high foot traffic areas. And that was basically my marketing uh, for the first, yeah. well, I don't know, however long, five, mm -hmm. six years of being in business. But um, that, so those people already feel like they know us once they've been in our store, whether they purchased or not. Yeah. Um, so they already kind of know who we are, what we're about, and then really building, cultivating that relationship has been a lot more successful than trying to, you know, find a lookalike audience or, or something that can expand nationally. So yeah. we found the best way just from sitting in the advertiser's seat for different brands is that the, the only way that people are able to take the the, the uniqueness that is a one-on-one -on -one interaction in an actual store. I mean, because when you think about that one-on-one -on -one interaction, like you are in the store, you are completely engulfed in all the five senses, right? You see, smell, hear, feel. Um, you're, you're getting all the body language of the people around you. So you very, very quickly from a branding tribal standpoint say, I fit into this company's culture or I don't. And it's, it's very, very immediate, right? Yep. Um and, and, and it is difficult to your point to, to translate that online. And we have found that the ones that really double down on the organic marketing from a content storytelling piece unique mm -hmm. to each platform. So, uh, for instance, TikTok is having its big moment in the sun right now. It's the big platform and will continue to be going into 23 is my prediction. I mean, it's a very, very safe prediction to make based on the data <laughs> of consumption time on those platforms, but 
Uh, we're seeing tons of brands that are just blowing up on those because they're bringing somebody internally in that has a little bit of a storytelling DNA to them and, and, and can do that. And then they go around the store basically like filming some of the day-to-day -day life or they put together like from a clothing standpoint, I could see them putting together like, you know, looks and um, it's like the, the mannequin, but putting it online digitally. Like there's a lot of things you can do from a storytelling aspect. And what we find is that the ones that can do that consistently – and stay consistent because it's so hard to like, oh, you want me to do another like three TikTok videos today? Like I'm, that's a lot. Back to the creative it's bandwidth. It's easy to get started, you know? Yeah, it's easy to start. It's hard to keep going and it's it's exhausting. And, but the ones that stick to it, they, they what they end up doing is those algorithms are their, their interest-based algorithms. And so what they're doing is they're going out and showing the content to people and saying, hey, are you interested in fashion? Okay, you are. Are you interested in this kind of fashion that, Finley's is putting together and then you say okay cool now we're going to show you more and more and more of their videos and then that's the only real way to get um to build that tribe online and then I mean it's pretty powerful like you end up seeing people that will um it, it's like the modern day television in a weird way like people see these people that create content for brands and they're getting stopped in the streets and people are taking selfies with them it's 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 wild and it's like you're just an employee of a company but people treat them like they're celebrities for some weird reason. So I don't know. I don't, have you guys done anything with like TikTok or Instagram reels or any of that stuff? Yeah, we have. Um, I'm actually personally, I kind of skipped the whole Instagram thing. I went from like Facebook to TikTok. And so um, I, I love the idea of TikTok. Um, so we do, I don't think that we do it as, well, I mean, when you're talking about doing the storytelling, I don't know that we spend the time to utilize that platform no. in that way. Um, and it, it goes even further, I feel like, for a lot of fashion, like it's just some of the excitement, I feel like, um, in the different channels for mm -hmm. retail. Um, but where I can see, like, you can... I mean, you can go live and sell, you can do a lot of mm -hmm. like really come into the customers to our, you know, our target customers realm and be their right. friend or their, you know, like I, and not, I won't say influence. It's just really being that person, that trusted partner connection uh, right right so i feel like there's a huge opportunity in that it's definitely so marketing for me personally and for our business like i said it was just all about like the locations yeah. um mm -hmm. initially and since covid really was kind of a wake-up call for me personally to say that even though we always had online and like online like i'm i feel like i'm a super consumer of digital content with podcasts. I'm not as much of a YouTuber like my kids are because I don't have that attention span. <laughs> um, but I am right there with you. <laughs> but I do see what you're talking about, how like, yeah, my kids don't know anybody that's in the mainstream media, but there are certain YouTube influencers. Super niche. Yeah. 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 That is for their specific areas of interest so it, it is so interesting but for me personally i was like i don't we're all plans for growth are going to be in growing our website our digital um footprint and even in the last two years since that like a lot of people said that during covid tiktok really did kind of grow a lot because mm -hmm. of a lot of people being at home and and, mm -hmm. and being able to utilize it for their, their, you know, creative outlet or their consu consumption yeah. of what people know. I mean, it's just amazing. So yeah, that's my goal for 2023. Um, as I feel like we're a little bit more stable in terms of what we're experiencing as a company yeah. from a growth standpoint to really dig into the different marketing and digital marketing aspects and 
and what that could mean for our business. I mean, good gosh, you survived the freaking pandemic with brick and mortar stores. So, I mean, that's, that's freaking, uh, amazing. We're two I mean, years, three old, locations. Yeah. I mean, that's two full years after good. 2020. And I think I, yeah, to your point, I mean, hats off. I, I, I know we all saw business after business close their doors because, you know, they just didn't know how to pivot. They didn't know how to, you know, survive, um, all the change. And, you know, in the digital advertising realm, uh, we saw it even digitally. I mean, there were so many changes over the last two or three years to these major advertising platforms. A lot of people gave up. Um, there were so many, I mean, privacy things happening at the same time as the global, you know, pandemic. And uh, so many people just struggled to keep up. And so, yeah, definitely hats off to you for one, making it and, and two, for kind of setting that goal of growing that digital marketing footprint. Because I think to your point, uh, if e-commerce growing that platform is is kind of where you see uh, the business kind of growing in the near future, it'll definitely help you. What's interesting to me is that most people end up testing that stuff and then they're like, ah, it's easier. I'm already established doing the brick and mortar thing, so I'm not even going to worry about evolving my business and trying something new. Uh, I'm just going to do what works and, and call it a day. And then they, they look up 10 years later and you know, they're gone and the, the world has changed and they didn't change their, I mean, from a fashion standpoint, even if you don't keep going to markets and seeing what the new fashion is, uh, you're going to run outdated skews. And then all of a sudden people come in and they're like, ah, you know, Finley's doesn't really have stuff for me anymore. It's not, they're not keeping up with the times. And it's funny that some people look at that and they go, well, they, they can organically update their SKUs, but they don't think to continually update their business practices. So uh, I wonder if being in fashion has made you more organically do that. So it's interesting that you just have to do it. And so now you're you're in the middle of doing it. I always the, like the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> that's good to know. We're, uh, we're, well, we're neighbors now, so we're going to have to like meet up and like, I don't know, play checkers or something like that at Cracker Barrel. <laughs> I, I think we need to have a throwdown. So the... <laughs> The other question I have is about Finley specifically is that you 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 purchased a pre-existing business instead of starting something from scratch. And this is something I'm fascinated with. We we have a a really cool guest coming on in a couple of weeks called uh his name's Walker Diebel. He wrote the book Buy Then Build and his whole thesis yeah. is buy existing businesses that are already sort of established and then grow them and you can update them and maybe you get them on the internet and you get them doing digital ads and all the things. So like what was there a specific reason you bought something instead of just trying to start something from scratch? And then like, do you feel like that was a, a better way to do it versus starting a market from scratch? Because it's interesting. You ended up rebranding it anyways, but mm -hmm. I'd love to know what you think about that. Yeah, I think that I get asked about that a lot and I have seen that book. So that's going to be a great conversation. I actually, I read a book as well. Um, and it was written by a local guy. I randomly lucked upon it, um, and it was called Buy a Business Close to Home, and I, it was, I don't know, I mean, it was just like a simple little book, and sometimes you, I, I'm a big reader and a listener of podcasts and stuff, and what I think I realized reading that book was that if someone else could do it, I could do it. And so I like a plan, but I feel like my goals are kind of less defined, less planful. So like my goal was to ha have my own business. Okay. Um, <laughs> and then my goal was, uh, I, I kind of defined it into, okay, it should be retail. Cause I kind of know that I've been in that industry. I've been selling cheese like a mad woman. It's time to That's sell right. some, something else. <laughs> That's right. I did. I did. Which side note, Finley's needs a little like cheese counter now. Cause I've been into Finley's a bunch. I'm in downtown Franklin all the time. <laughs> yeah. And my wife takes me in there all the time. Like I've been in that store and I've never seen cheese anywhere. And now that we're friends, I'm very disappointed, Don, that I've never gotten like a free sample of cheese inside of Finley's. Like, come on. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Note. We'll You're have out of the cheese meat, business. Right? <laughs> Just for you. There you go. Um, but so yeah, yeah, so you're so by it was it was something about you always wanted to own a business and then yeah. and then it was just a it was it a mindset thing for you that needed to change to take that first step? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think it was that realization, and this is kind of what I tell people a lot, is, like, there's nothing special about me, you know, um, there, and that was, I think, reading through that book, it, the voice of the author, it was just so, like, oh, you know, it, it, it like, so matter, matter of fact, fact. and yeah. it, it felt simplified a little bit, maybe. Well, if he can do it, I'm no dummy. So I can do that too. Um, yeah. And I just, I didn't, I had never thought of it, but yeah, certainly, um, certainly I think it, it, I actually for, um, you know, just to kind of jump ahead, we do have, I do have a brand. So in 2022, we've started our own brand um, that can be its own you know, its own little offshoot of Finley's and it's a lot harder to do it that way versus, you know, buying the business that was already, even though it wasn't great processes, we did rebrand it. Like, yeah. you know, I bought it in September and February, I shut it down. Like we, me and my husband like painted the walls and replaced the flooring and <laughs> made it a little, a little cuter. Um, and, um, rebranded it because I found out, you know, it's like, um, you just got to make these uh, evolutions mm -hmm. and incremental I think that, change over time. Yeah. 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 I think there's something too about, um, when you buy a business that I, my first business, Austin, and I've talked about this a ton was a barbecue restaurant and we started it in a tent on the side of the road. So it was literally Ooh. from zero with like five grand and ran that thing for six years, but it was brutally tough. I mean, it was, it was unnecessarily tough. And what we found out, or when we finally turned the corner, what we did was similar to you. We had purchased a existing barbecue restaurant. Like we bought them out of their lease essentially is what we did. Yeah. Um, and they, they were happy to do it because they were older and wanted to retire. And, you know, restaurants are interesting things. They're not, they're valued or very different than most businesses. But, um, we rebranded it to Lyle's Barbecue was the name of the company and it crushed, but it crushed because people are already used to going to that location to get barbecue. It was in a better location than we had ever been before. It already had momentum. It already had all the plumbing and all the things like there was some easier things that didn't have to be redone or done from zero. And it saved us a bunch of money. And yeah, I'm, I, I'm very quickly becoming a fan of the the buying businesses model and just sort of fixing them. I will say that my gut tells me that they should be at least five years old and doing at least, I don't know, $500,000 or more in revenue, depending on what the actual business is. Just to, because if five years is, there's something about, so you guys have been in business nine years now. Do you feel like it's easier now than it was four years ago? Was there something around the five-year hump that made it sort of click for you guys? Or was there a certain time period that it, it got a little, the momentum started actually rolling where it wasn't you just like grinding super, super hard every day. Yeah. I would say in 2016, we had a total pivot point. Um, and, and the, the difference was, um, I, a few things, which is, I think I had two team members that just knew what they were doing. They didn't need me. They, mm -hmm. you know, they were teaching me. I like for the first you know, three to five years, I was learning about the fashion industry from my team, you know, um, I had a lot to learn. And then uh, we, we actually got a better system, uh, a POS system that had better, like real time information. And, um, and it just allowed more decision making capabilities. Yeah, it goes back into the data piece, right? I mean, it, it kind of probably, if I had to guess, a new POC probably gave you clarity into the decisions that you were needing to make, right? Especially if there used to be a lag time in the data that you're getting to make those decisions. Now it's quicker, probably smoother, a little bit easier to use. And now all of a sudden you probably felt pretty free to, to make those because the decisions became more, you know, obvious, easy to, easy to make. Is that the case? Yeah, so we would, you know, we are always talking about like best sellers, like what's the interaction of the of mm -hmm. the customer with the product, and so we are biased. Um, like even today, 
you know, like we're biased by that interaction with the customer. So let's say I'm going back to that lady who was in the fitting room and she just really loved this top, you know, this specific top. It looked great on her and maybe like three other people commented, but maybe they didn't buy it, but they commented about that top. Well, at the end of the day, my mind is like, woo, this top. This top is amazing. Yep. It's really working. We got to get more of these tops. You got to get more of these tops. Well, I'm biased because I already have like a positive emotion towards that top. Mm. Whereas you go and you look at the numbers and you're like, well, that top, we sold the, that one to the lady that I was interacting with, but we sold like 15 of this other top that I never even noticed people like picking up. It just sold itself. You know, I want more mm -hmm. of those tops than yeah. this one top. Um, and yeah, and inventory management, I think, if you're just talking about retail, is key. Uh, yeah, okay. I mean, there's all different types. You know, if you're talking about the business of barbecue or restaurant, it's kind of Oh, the I same. have a perfect Food story costs. for this. <laughs> yeah, the okay, a perfect story. We made, so our menu was 100% made from scratch. That was sort of how we tried to differentiate ourselves. And we, we did that by listening to customers and listening to customers is really important, Don. You're really right about that. And, but we, we, we had a few people that came in and we heard a little bit of feelings about, Hey, do you guys have healthier options? And we were like, okay, yeah, like we can expand the manual menu a little bit and get some healthier options in here. And so we, we did a salad and it was a great salad, spring mix, great smoked meat on there, you know, all those things. And then we did like homemade dressings because we were just extra and had to do like made from scratch ranch and made from scratch croutons and like it, water by the way well i'm That's i'm true. in marketing and i was Almost in the restaurant business for six years i've you know i am a pro at this this is it's a habit that dies hard <laughs> but but the thing was is i love that salad i had it every day for lunch and then the people that had it i'd always ask them and i was biased because i liked it and i wanted it to stay and every time i'd ask it I, i'd ask somebody about it they said they love it and every time i I sold one for some reason it stuck out in my mind more that, Oh, we're, we're doing more salads. And then I went back. Um, we had a process like every 90 days, every quarter, we would look at our, our sales and we'd look at every skew, every menu item, and we would see what sold and how much sold. And because in our business, cost of goods sold is not a shirt that I can liquidate for 90% off. It's just in the garbage can. It's, it's yep. dead at uh, dead, dead. And, uh, I went back and pulled the numbers on those salads and we had sold like 42 in a month. And so we were selling like a little over one a day, but I was so biased to it. And I had thought I had gotten so much feedback that we needed it. And it was like, we were selling 1.2 a day. And, uh, it was just, we were throwing out a lot of lettuce and vegetables are expensive. It's a whole thing. And we had to get rid of the salad. And then I swear right after that, as soon as it went away, and I bet you've had this happen, like you've gotten rid of a a item in the shop that wasn't selling. There's a few like diehard people that just show up out of the woodwork as soon as it's gone. And they're like, where's the thing? Where's the, it was the one Why'd person you... that was buying it every day, <laughs> every day. Yep. And now they're mad. It's gone. And, and you have to do what's right for the business. So I, I, I feel your pain so much. I'm having flat. I'm having PTSD right now about the <laughs> restaurant business. And so thank you. I didn't know that was going to happen on my rainy day today, but I'm officially not working the rest of the day, Don. And I was just going to chill like that's, that's what's happening. And it's all your fault. And, uh, I'd go to Finley's and get some cheese and eat my sorrows away, but there's no cheese there. So it's fine. There's no cheese. <laughs> so the, uh, the question we ask all of our guests is we call it the 10 X question. If I could 10 X your budget tomorrow, like what would you spend it on to make Finley's even bigger and better? I, it's an open-ended question and it takes money off the table because money is a limiting factor. Cash flow is an issue for business owners, especially small businesses like, uh, you and us and, so I'd love to know if we could 10 X your budget tomorrow, where are you spending it to make Finley's the greatest? I mean, there is no other answer other than talent, talent, talent. Mm. Um, it's a great answer. <laughs> I will say, you know, trying to grow and acquire talent has been a real challenge for us in the past, especially, you know, past year or two, um, because I think there's just areas, uh, yeah, I think there's certain areas in, in the world today, and maybe mm -hmm. it's all areas where, um, if you, if the, if the people are good, they, they get the, they get yeah. the, the, I don't know. 
the value <laughs> yeah. of it. Yeah. So, well, they, um, they end up taking and coming alongside you and like, they can actually help, help you achieve the sort of vision that's in your head. And that's, yeah. I think I'll, like, I really underestimated that my first time around with owning a restaurant, I was looking at, I was more on the data side of things back then. And I was going, oh, our labor cost has to be 30% or whatever it was back then. And it cannot exceed that number. And I made decisions based on a arbitrary number versus like, what is the actual vision for the company? And do we have the right people here? Like, should I pay 20% more per hour, which you're talking about four or $5, or should I, and get the incredible benefit from that? Or should I just look at the numbers and just manage to the numbers? And that's what we did. And that was a mistake for a long time, for sure. So I think people is a great, it, it's, it doesn't have to be, we find out it, it, business isn't complicated. Like it's pretty simple. Like you have a good product or service. You do what you said you were going to do. You have really nice, good people that do the thing and they make it happen. And like, you know, your business tends to grow year over year. I don't know how you feel about that, but that that's at least what Austin and I have seen time and time again, especially with this interview. And getting people in the right seat on the, on the bus, you know, when you find that perfect fit, the person that does have the talent that you really need to move the business forward without you having to be kind of the hovering helicopter business owner. I think that's to your point. Uh, that's why I said that's a fantastic answer. I mean, 10 xing the talent on your team. I can only imagine how free that would make you to be able to go and grow the business in different directions and make better strategic decisions because your time, your energy is, is freed up by those kind of highly talented individuals. It's a fantastic answer. Yeah. We, I mean, obviously digital marketing and digital advertising is, um, it's a highly specialized skill. And in order to find people that have that kind of senior level of talent or experience, it's, it's not easy to your point. And so finding them one, and then obviously two, being able to afford them. And uh, to Chandler's point, you know, sometimes you do have to make shifts or make compromises in the, in the name of growing something in the future. So really, I, I love that answer. I could probably continue to hype that answer up, but. Do you mind if I ask you a question? Please, please. Um, so what I feel like for, you know, I'm in a kind of group of other boutique owners. Um, and so a lot more, uh, a lot of them are more uh, successful online or completely online. Um, mm -hmm. but, and this last year is a little bit has been challenging for them because of the digital marketing they were doing that was not, uh, did not return as much as, you know, previous years with, I think, some mm -hmm. different changes. And so has it been difficult to transition the mindset of, digital marketers like in that way do you mean over the last couple of years yes. specifically as things have changed yeah i think so the the biggest thing for us is staying on top of these changes because changes are they're happening faster than they ever have um and they're becoming more and more complex and so the hard thing that business owners like you experience all the time and it's again especially over the last couple of years is how do I manage to stay on top of this while ensuring that the business is doing what it needs to be doing? Because it's a lot. I mean, Google released a 30 to 40 page document uh, a couple months ago outlining how changes to their algorithm will be rolled out over the next year or so. And not many people have the time or mental energy to comb through 40 pages of algorithmic, you know, data being yeah. poured out for you. It's, a lot to keep up with facebook and, and apple you know they battled over the last three years and that's completely changed the way people run facebook ads and so yeah for us it's been staying on top of everything you know having regular check-ins with our google reps facebook reps you know the people at TikTok, making sure that we're on top of everything so that way nothing surprises us because a lot of the time you know we have weekly calls with our reps and they will tell us hey you know, by January 1 of this date, you know, whatever it is, uh, expect this to happen. And, and this is how you can be prepared. And so what we try to do is we do all of that heavy lifting for our clients. And so we then try to pass that along to say, hey, you know, this is what to expect. 
This is what we need to be setting up in the meantime to prepare for it. These are the things we need to be testing to ensure that when these changes happen, we're in a good place to make decisions on, you know, we're at a fork in the road, which direction do we need to go? Uh, and so I, I would say that, yes, we have seen a lot of people over the last two or three years struggle to keep up. Um, and that's kind of why we try our best to kind of take that mental learning and keeping up piece. Um, we try to take that off of business owners. So a John, lot of people you... for retail and – oh, go ahead, Joan. Well, I was just going to say, John, are you asking about from a – just so I'd be clear here, the – like those people that are more heavily doing advertising and it, their ads have changed and they're not working as well as they used to. Is that specifically what you're asking yeah. about for those people? I, well, yeah. And, and I think just that the, like, I don't know. I just, I specifically spoke to one person and just how frustrated she was because what mm -hmm. was working was no longer working. Yeah. And yep. I think I feel like, well, we just adjust, you know, you kind of, yeah. Like, that's it. That's the answer yeah, because well, you, you, you basically, exactly. it's back to what you just said with 10 Xing people where you want to have as many of the right people on your team as possible. And, and it depends on where you're at as a, as a business owner, right? So if you're a more of a startup sub $500,000 a year in revenue, like you're probably doing a lot of the marketing activities on your own and, and you're going to have to just do as much as you can, as well as you can. And, and some of it will work and some of it won't, but as you grow, you can continue to bring on those other people. And that's, that's why we've had a lot of success over the last year of running this company is that we're just specialists in marketing. Like you're the, you're the boutique owner. You're the person that knows fashion and you're going to markets. We're not doing that. But like when you come to us and you say, Hey, I've got this new product and like we stay up to date with like Google. So Austin mentioned the Google doc that came out. Well, that thing's already out of date three months later because Google is now freaking out about TikTok being the number one search engine for Gen Z. And so it's like, and, and then even, even more recently this week, we're just getting this stuff out. It's a, uh, there's an AI that has come out, artificial intelligence, where you're basically asking it questions and it's giving you answers that are better than what Google can return to you. So who even knows what's going to end up coming out what with that? that? So yeah, it's called, uh, it's like open graph or something. I'll send you the info after the oh fact. It's, goodness. it's fascinating. It's, uh, it's scary. AI is blowing my mind right now. I will tell you, I spent an hour yeah. that I didn't have to spend yesterday because it sucked me in and Austin's face is sick, but it, it got me. I mean, it wrote, I mean, I watched it write a thousand word blog. I watched it write. I mean, I, I, it's crazy. Um, but the, it, you, you just, I think it comes down to this. Like you as a business owner have two decisions to make a lot of times when you have profit, like, are you going to take that money off the table, put it in your own pocket, which is great. It's your prerogative. It's why you started a business. It was to you know, create financial freedom for yourself, definitely. Or are you going to take that money, reinvest it back into the business? And reinvesting money into the business does not mean the business lost money and we reinvested all the money. Like that's not how re reinvesting work. And I'm not talking to you specifically, Don, you know, but like other people out there listening. Um, and so if you make a profit, like are you reinvesting that money to your point back into putting the right people on your team? And that's the question. It's like from a marketing standpoint, is it just you handling all the marketing? Is it one person internally that was kind of good at doing organic social media? And now you as the business owner are asking them to run paid ads, which those are two different skill sets entirely. I mean, that is a, um, the marketing discipline, even public relations is a different skill set. There are, there are 10 different disciplines inside of marketing. And what we see a lot of times when we get involved with companies, they have a, uh, we tend to work with companies that are between one and $10 million in revenue and that they have a marketing manager in place that's doing a lot. Maybe they're working with one or two outside firms, but for the most part, that marketing manager is running emails. They're doing all the social media. They're messing around running ads, which is dangerous because those platforms clicking will the take boost your money button. so That's fast. Yeah, the, <laughs> the Austin's dreaded blue boost button that he's trying to get them to get rid of. <laughs> he, he hates Facebook's blue boost button. I mean, it just takes money. Like it's not. We really might have gotten banned thing. for a little while for <laughs> running an ad telling people not to use that yeah. button. We did get uh, a fight like Facebook that about that. I have heard but it, that before too. <laughs> but it all comes down to, you know, it, does your business need to improve this, the skill sets around that specific discipline? Even sales, right? Like if you're, if you're looking into it, the, the, the advice doesn't change if you have salespeople inside of your company, right? You're looking in, you're going, hey, we're not upselling enough items. Like I feel like as the business owner, we could be doing a better job selling at the, on the floor, right? And so then you bring new people in that will help you do that better. It's, it's just a question of, do you have the right people based on your budget um, yeah. that can take you to the next level? I hope that answers your question. We love marketing, so we could do a 
four hour TED talk on marketing for you right now. Well, I just, you know, when you mentioned that, how things are changing and it is a lot. And I think, yeah, I mean, like I said, marketing, digital marketing, digital platforms, the, and I, I may be using the total wrong term, but I just kind of think you're of nailing it as physical and digital. I ha I'm a simple minded person. It's fair. Uh, <laughs> now, but, and I don't think you need to make it complicated either, because at the end of the day, people try to make these platforms very complicated and I guess they can be as complicated as you want them to be. But ultimately it's one person with a phone on the other end, looking at a picture or looking at a video, reading your copy. It's still people to people. There's just a machine in between. Uh, yeah. It's the people that yeah. forget that there's a person and you're not just doing things for an algorithm. They're there's a whole in trouble. There's a whole category of marketing experts called MarTech, marketing technology people. And I'll tell you, over the last three years, that job, the value of those people has skyrocketed. And we've got, in my opinion, one of the best ever in that position on our bus. And that's why I think we've been able to help people stay ahead of that curve. Because when you get this big, scary flag from Facebook that says, oh, you've got this you know, piece of code that's incorrect on your website, and we got to fix it before you can do anything. It's, it's a panic for business owners that, that don't speak that language. Mm -hmm. But for it's a panic the for the marketing manager together, that doesn't speak that language. And then exactly. they got to go tell the business owner and then you have two people in a room going, Oh, <laughs> that's right. And it's scary. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Well, yeah. when talking to her, it kind of made me, like I said, what we have found valuable is kind of still like, I guess, like the old fashioned way, <laughs> like mm -hmm. they're walking into our store. Like it made me a little bit um, more secure, I guess, in the fact that, okay, there's some basic tenets of business that that don't change. A lot of things change, but still like what you're saying, that person to person interaction, but yeah, you know, it just kind of, but it, it did make me switch my thinking about what does it look like to acquire customers? What is the cost to acquire mm -hmm. customers? Yeah. How are we really valuing our customers to, to yeah. serve them so that they become real loyal? Yeah. At Hybeam, we have a, um, we have a system that we basically, anytime we bring a a client in like that's the system we sell and it all starts with it starts with like what problems are our customers facing what products do we have to solve those problems and and who are the actual like demographic psychographic of those people and then it goes from there around to like who's the relatable character inside the organization that those people can connect with because it's all human one-to-one -one. um and then there's some other things like pillar content and micro content with social media and then paid advertising and consistency finishes the wheel out but the, the core thesis of that flywheel for us that we sell everybody is that if you're not relationship building first, if you're not tribe building first, um, if you're not trying to create a place of community first and you have a, you have to have a long-term mindset with it. Um, you can't just want it to work in three months. You got to be like, all right, we're committing to this for the next five years. And no matter what happens, we're going to figure it out. It's very much like when you bought the business, you're now all in, uh, we have to figure this out because otherwise it's going to be really bad for everybody financially. Like a lot of people fail with their marketing efforts because they don't, especially um, business owners in that one to $10 million range, because they still have that like hustler startup founder mentality and they haven't applied it to other areas of the business where you go, no matter what happens, we're going to figure out how to build the best marketing vehicle for our business possible. Um, and that's kind of how you eventually go from that one to $10 million range to the $50 million range to the $100 million. Range. Like that's the only way you can scale is you start applying that same fanatical discipline to those other um, areas versus like the business as a whole, if that makes sense. I, that's probably my whole TED talk on that. <laughs> subject. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I mean, I feel like it's kind of, it circles back to what we talked about at the beginning, which is that our, like, I, I don't know what else is going to happen. We're going to maintain mm -hmm. what we're doing physically, but we're going to figure out the digital. That's it. Yeah. I find that if you're spending like 10% of your budget, whatever that number is on R and D, you know, research and development, you're basically assuming, I don't care if any of this works. I don't care if it brings me $1 back. We're just testing and learning and trying to find the next thing that ultimately drives the majority of our revenue five years from now. And what a lot of people do because they, especially small business owners, you're so cash flow 
focused as you should be because cash flow issues are the number one reasons why businesses close in our in our ranges you and I and so they're they're very cognizant of what their cash position is so to tell them hey you're basically going to spend it with no expectation of return and they come back to you and go I'm definitely not doing that and then they they look up 5 years later and nothing has really changed for their business it's just more of the same and maybe they might have like you should have been testing not you but people should have been testing TikTok 3 years ago when it was a very small thing they should have been spending 10% of their time are and Dean that platform because it's really, really blowing up certain brands online right now, 36 months later. But they, those are the ones that spent the time figuring it out three years ago when there was no ROI case and everybody was going, Oh, you mean the, the dancing app for children? Like, I don't want to try to sell my stuff on that platform. Like it's always, that's always the, the telltale sign. You mean the fancy internet box? Like it's, it's always a, you know, the new thing is always scary and a waste of time. And most of the time it is. Um, but the times when it's not, it ends up being TikTok and it's turning people into massive brands. Like it's just, you know, you just don't want to miss them. So, well, Don, I, I appreciate this. I feel like we could do another hour easily, but I want to be uh, respectful of your time. So we'll have to have you on in a few months to do a, a part two. I think I got, I've got more questions for you as well. So, uh, is there anything else you want to go over before we let you go? No, I think uh, you, you, I've enjoyed the conversation. I do feel like it's been a, a good conversation and I have a lot to think about. Um, because where am I going to get 10 times the budget? That's hey, what I need to figure out. <laughs> you, I, and Austin, we're going to go all in on the next uh, big lottery drawing that gets over a billion dollars. We're going to hit it. <laughs> And then we're 10x in everybody's budget. It's as simple as that, right? <laughs> I, 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 I'm going to hold you to that. <laughs> foolproof plan, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's, it, my hand. <laughs> it's foolproof plan. It can't go wrong. Well, we appreciate everybody listening. We'll make sure to put all of Don's information and Finley's information in the show notes to this episode. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. Peace. <laughs>